Okay, let's begin. Uh, again, my name is Bill Ray, and I'll be presenting to you today information on how to finance your small business while building your retirement security as well. As a small business majority, we are a national nonprofit 501c3 organization that's been in existence for 11 years. And we have offices uh, in t uh, eight states uh, around the country, 10 offices in eight states around the country. Uh, and our focus is on issues of top importance to strengthen small business owners, including those who are self-employed, on issues such as access to capital, workforce issues such as sick day policies, the minimum wage, health care benefits available to small business owners, retirement security, which we'll talk about a little bit today, uh, taxes, and as I said, access to capital and lending options to start, launch, and grow your business. What makes us different is that our work is supported by business research. And what also makes us different is we're not a membership organization. We are an education, policy, and advocacy organization on behalf of small businesses. We also have an entrepreneurship portal, which you can visit at smallbusinessportal.org in your spare time, which actually brings additional resources and education to you, the small business owners, in areas uh, in key areas of growing your business. So today we're going to talk about the alternative funding landscape, Small Business Borrowers Bill of, Bill of Rights, <clears throat> the retirement gap, and ways to build your retirement security as small business owners, and some tools and resources, and then answer some questions that you may have. And feel free during this webinar to ask questions. Uh, you can type them again in the lower left-hand corner box on your computer screen, and we'll get to those questions at the end of the webinar. So let's talk about capital right now. Uh, we know that capital is crucial for the startup and survival of small businesses. You need capital for your equipment and resources to start and operate your business. However, the problem is that inadequate access to capital and credit is actually a top issue facing small business owners and entrepreneurs. What's happening is that since the recession of 2008, small business bank lending has been down by 20%. And actually, various polls and our own scientific polls show that 90% of small businesses say that the availability of credit is a problem in terms of launching and growing their business. In reality, what it is is that big banks simply aren't lending as they have in the past for anything under $40,000. For them, as banks, it's simply not marketable and profitable. Uh, and as I stated, small business bank lending has been down 20% since before the Great Recession, and the banks are simply more risk-averse with their underwriting standards. Simply put, if you're a lender and the fees are the same for a loan that's a half a million dollars as they are for a loan that's $30,000, it's just simply not worth their time and money uh, to go after the smaller loan. And, and understand that it's nothing personal. So for small businesses, it's more difficult for owners to obtain a loan. Plus, it can be costlier to underwrite these loans for the banks as well. Another reason small business bank lending is down is there has been a consolidation of community banks. Since the Great Recession, many of them have closed down or they've been consumed by some other larger bank subsidiary. Community banks are the banks that are locally owned uh, usually, and sometimes they're owned by a, a local family, which tend to focus on lending that would benefit the community and economic development. So one of the main focuses of community banks are small business owners. However, as I said, the consolidation of community banks and the mass proliferation of consolidation of banks across the country makes it more and more difficult for small businesses to access this type of lending. Women and minority-owned businesses have even more disadvantages in, in terms of accessing lending and credit. They face significant barriers. Typically, as a business, they're smaller in size. They start out with less capital. For women, for women themselves, they tend to be approved for approximately half the amount 
that men do when applying for lending. They also tend to have lower approval rates and smaller dollar amounts that they're going for. In addition to that, for women and minority-owned firms, especially for any who are immigrant-owned businesses, they can be subjects of predatory lending as well. So there's a lot to understand in terms of access, accessing capital and launching and growing your small business and knowing what some of the barriers are that already exist and how it's more heightened for women and minority-owned businesses. But there is good news. There are more funding options available today than ever before to start and grow your business. So we're going to get into access to capital and key questions to ask when seeking funding. Some important questions for you to consider are, how much money do you need? What do you need it for? How long do you think it's going to take to pay that money back? And this goes, this goes to knowing what your credit score is and understanding the shape of your finances within your business and even your personal finances because your personal finances are very closely tied to your business finances, especially when you're a new business just starting out. You want to ask yourself, how long have you been in business? Oftentimes, banks want to see or lending institutions want to see a minimum amount of time that you've been in business for before there is any credit or capital that they would extend to you as a small business owner. And you want to know how much collateral uh, you have to put up for the loan and what collateral is needed, what type of collateral they will allow you to use. And you'd be surprised to know that actually there are lenders out there, very reputable, reputable lenders, that will provide you lending uh, 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 with collateral such as a used car as long as you show the character uh, that you are worthy to pay that loan back. The last question is you want to know the difference between the debt and equity financing. Are you seeking debt financing or are you seeking equity financing, which I'll go over in just a minute. Here on this slide is just some sources of traditional and alternative funding for small business owners. They've been used to access capital and credit. And what you see here is some people will borrow from family and friends. They'll use personal credit cards. Some use home equity loans, bank loans, small business administration loans, community development uh, 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 financial institutions, which uh, are often these days called CDFIs, microloans, so on and so forth. Now, we're going to focus on some sources of lending in this presentation today that are outside of the big banks, and they're called, generally speaking, alternative sources of funding. Before we begin, as I noted, you need to understand the differences between the types of funding that you're looking for. Are you looking for debt financing, which is money you're going to have to pay back, usually with interest over a certain period of time. Some examples of that are bank loans and credit cards. Or are you looking for equity financing, where you give up a portion of ownership of your business in exchange for money from investors, whereby they actually become part owners of your company. Now, I don't know how many of you on this call have actually watched the show Shark Tank. Uh, well, that is an example of equity-based financing. Angel investors and venture capitalists make their investment in order to own a portion of your business. So that's part of the reason you, uh, for you to know what equity financing is. Oftentimes, equity financing will use angel investors and venture capitalists when they actually consider a large amount of funding to be invested in their business. Also consider the type of business that you, that you have and what it's positioned for. What type of funding is welcomed into your business? You know, recognize that, you know, for instance, if you are starting a biotech company, the funding that you're going to need for that enterprise is going to be a lot different than someone who's starting a lawn care business. So you have to understand what type of funding would be welcomed into the business that you're potentially looking to uh, start or to grow. So now we've gotten through some key questions to ask yourself. Now we're going to talk about the funding landscape. 
uh, community development financial institutions, SBA back loans, community banks and credit unions, and then we'll go into alternative online lenders. So <clears throat> let's talk about the alternative sources of financing outside of the big banks that you hear about. There are community development financial, financial institutions. Now sometimes they're referred to as CDFIs. Generally speaking, CDFIs offer loans for less than $250,000 for small business owners who are typically ineligible for, for traditional bank loans. You can use these loans for a wide range of purposes. Uh, the most important thing that I want uh, to talk to you about regarding CDFIs is that they're actually around in part to help you become more bankable in the future with bigger banks. They're dedicated to accessible and affordable lending to underserved entrepreneurs, especially in moderate to low-income communities where you'll usually find them. But that doesn't mean that they're limited to low-income individuals. They have actually been a growing source of lending for many small business owners around the country because, again, the bigger banks aren't lending to startup and new businesses. CDFIs do also offer that really in-depth uh, support. It includes mentoring, technical assistance, and they offer smart loan programs and small loans less than $50,000 for those who may need a loan of a smaller amount, usually anywhere from $1,000 up to $50,000. There are some CDFIs uh, that will also loan up to a half a million dollars. So it really depends on what CDFIs are available in your area. Another source of loans are SBA loans. Now, I don't know how many of you uh, heard of the Small Business Administration. They are not a lending institution. They are actually a government agency that's there to help launch and support small businesses. Because I don't know if you know this, but small business owners, as small business owners, you generally employ 50% of jobs in the private sector in the United States. You as small business owners are actually a very important part of a thriving economy and a local neighborhood. And the Small Business Administration, which is part of the United States government, recognizes this and the importance of small business owners. So there are SBA loans. They themselves are not the lender, but they guarantee loans to institutions, community banks, CDFIs, which I talked about uh, as another lending institution. And what they do is they guarantee the loans in case there is a default to the intermediary lenders so that they are able to support small business owners who need assistance in lending. These loans can cover, once again, a wide range of uses for startups uh, like working capital. Uh, it can also cover real estate, equipment, and there are two primary programs. Uh, for the SBA loans, there's the 7A program, uh, which now is called the Advantage and Grow Loan. Uh, and there's also the CDC 504 loan. I'll give you more information at the end of this presentation, or you can visit the SBA website yourself to understand more of those loans and what they're about. There are also micro loans, which are under $50,000 uh, in the SBA Express Loan Program. There are loans for disaster relief, export assistance. Uh, they have programs, and, and I don't know how, how many of you here have a, a, a military background or you're a veteran but they also have loans to support veteran businesses, business owners in becoming entrepreneurs. So SBA loans are one option in addition to CDFIs I've talked about. They are reliable loans. Uh, probably the main drawback <clears throat> is that usually SBA loans take a little bit longer to apply for because they do, uh, since it is a, a federally backed loan, they will require additional paperwork and review time. So. Uh, you know, recognize that, yes, it may take a little longer, but there are loans that are reliable. Uh, they're good loans that you can work with within the course of running your business, and usually they will be at very good rates. 
Other sources and alternative funding are community banks and credit unions. Now, I did mention earlier there is a smaller number of community banks since the Great Recession due to consolidation of many of these banks, but they do still exist. Community banks are typically owned, uh, uh, are typically locally owned, and their primary goal is to support the local small business owners. So, if you've not looked at community banks, I really stress that you should take a look at your local community banks. And don't apply right away, but look at them as a viable option. Uh, credit unions that do small business banking, uh, which are nonprofit financial institutions, are also a really good option for you to look at. And recognize that not all credit unions will have small business lending. So those that do in your area, we do encourage you to take a look at those as an option as well. As you see on this screen here, the small business approval rates for community banks and credit unions, as opposed to the big banks, you see on this chart below, 50% approval rates by community banks, 43% by credit unions, as opposed to a measly 20% average by the bigger banks. I might add, though, the reason why I'm saying to look at them as options and talk to the lender before applying is that the more you apply for a loan that may not be appropriate for you and get turned down, the lower your credit score will be the next time you apply for a loan. So before you apply, be prepared and know what your options are and what the state of your financials are before you look at lending. Now, we've gone over CDFIs, small business administration loans, community banks, and credit unions. Now let's talk about online lenders now. That's another alternative source of lending. And it's great and it's innovative. The use of technology actually offers a lot of promise in lowering fees and such. There is usually a streamlined application process for many of them. However, be aware that online lending is largely unregulated at this point. Unlike the bigger banks and CDFIs, which are backed by the Department of the Treasury, which is the federal government, and <clears throat> unlike community banks and credit unions, online lenders are largely, once again, unregulated. They typically will have higher lending rates than banks, and not all online lenders are equal. Some players really try to hide their high rates in their terms, and it's because, it's because they are not regulated, <clears throat> and they are not required to disclose things in a manner which may be more transparent. So we're just advising you really to proceed with caution about online lending products. As you see here uh, in this bullet, um, many lenders actually use technology as a source of data uh, for lenders to assess your risk as a borrower. What that means is that banks may not only look at your FICO score, sometimes they will, but usually they, most of the time they will, but you know, uh, sometimes they won't. But these online lenders may also be looking at, uh, let's, see, let's say if you have a, a restaurant or you try to open a restaurant, they may look at your, your Yelp reviews to see if people actually like your food. Uh, so just be aware of these different factors which online lenders may also be using to assess your credit worthiness. With the use of technology and social data, there's a lot of new information out there, and uh, they may be taking those reviews into account, especially if you are a business that has a, a large social media presence. So let's talk about different types of online lenders. First, we have online marketplace lenders, and these are generally peer-to-peer uh, -peer lenders, and they basically connect small businesses to investors. Uh, you're going to go on a website, put in your information in order for them to match you up with different lenders, and you usually have the option of selecting which one. Again, most are term loans, and they're fixed. And they'll tell you the terms, and there usually is a stated APR, or annual percentage rate, 
Uh, online marketplace lenders, again, lenders that are online, tend to focus on having transparency in their pricing and overall process. Now, there are also online cash flow lenders. They offer short-term loans. Generally, people need these loans for working capital. However, the loan payments, unlike online marketplace lenders where they'll have multi-year term loans, Online cash flow lenders, they are offering you loans for cash flow. They're also going to take a daily deduction or fixed amount out of your sales. So let's say you, you make $500 in sales in one day and you sign up with one of these online cash flow uh, lenders, then that means that, and you sign up for them to take out 10% of your daily sales, then that means that they're going to take $50 of your $500 that you made uh, that day. So if you made $5,000, then that means uh, if they're taking 10% out, they're going to take $500 out of your daily sales. <clears throat> they will make a daily deduction from your fixed amount of sales in addition to what other fees may be required. The challenge with online cash flow lenders as opposed to marketplace lenders, they are going to require access to your bank account and payment system. So be really cautious of online cash flow lenders. They tend not to have transparent pricing and higher interest rates. Some examples of online cash flow lenders are companies like OnDeck, Cabbage, REI, and Central. I want to add that simply because the online lender is on the New York Stock Exchange, or maybe you see a celebrity person promoting them uh, in some commercial, that doesn't add any more credibility to that online lender. Again, that doesn't mean that they are regulated or monitored by the federal government or any other agency in any way. Just be wary of the marketing practices of online lenders. Not all online lenders, again, uh, are equal, and online lending is largely, again, unregulated. And keep in mind that some of the fees for online lending can be as high as 80%, uh, even upwards of 150%. So again, proceed with caution when you're looking at online lending. <clears throat> Another type of online lending, or a third type, is what's called merchant cash advance. This actually provides uh, cash upfront in exchange for a portion of your future sales. They'll take a percentage of your credit card and debit card sales daily until the loan is paid back. It's usually quick, unsecured loans, but at a very high price. Uh, but they, they are typically called uh, the payday loans of small businesses. So many of you in this webinar, I'm sure, have heard uh, about issues with payday loans around the country because many consumers were being taken advantage of. Well, merchant cash advances are sometimes known as the payday loans for small businesses. And we're not advocating one way or the other uh, because every business needs to do whatever it can to make sure that uh, it can stay in operation and stay profitable. But just proceed with caution in regards to the type of lending that is out there. And we want you to be aware of the lending that's out there, both in person and online. Crowdfunding is another source of online lending. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about crowdfunding. Typically, the basic concept is you raise funds by reaching out to a large number of people for a specific period of time online to raise money for your business. And there's usually a set period of time in which people can donate to you. The best campaigns are those that really inspire people to donate or invest. It's recommended that if you're looking at crowdfunding to have a really strong social media network, very strong. Uh, and I've heard numbers uh, like, you know, make sure your business has a following of anywhere between Three to 4,000 people. That's how strong your social media network uh, presence needs to be and is recommended by experts for crowdfunding to really be effective. And recognize that there are two types uh, of crowdfunding. There's what's called reward crowdfunding, and there's equity 
crowdfunding. So let, let's say someone is starting a restaurant uh, business. And I've done this myself. Uh, you know, a, a, a friend of mine was starting a restaurant, and I actually donated $15, got a T-shirt from them, and I'm glad I did. You know, they're still in business, and they were actually voted uh, the number two restaurant in our local sauce magazine here in the St. Louis region. Now, that's what's called reward crowdfunding. <clears throat> now, there's also equity crowdfunding. Uh, for small businesses in which uh, you would exchange a piece of your business or ownership to have operating capital to start or grow your business. So with all the different types of lending we just discussed, uh, I quickly want to touch upon predatory lending. It's actually a growing problem. As I said earlier in the slides, bigger banks simply aren't lending to small businesses uh, or small business owners, and we see a proliferation of online lending since 2008. In fact, online lending is growing by leaps and bounds. And not all on online lenders are bad. Uh, in fact, we work with a couple of them through the Responsible Business Lending Coalition. Now, the Responsible Business Lending Coalition began because of the decline of small business lending and online lenders stepped in to fill that void. But unfortunately, online lending, once again, is largely unregulated. So in the Small Business uh, uh, Lending Coalition, we got together and put together what's called the Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights. So the Small Business Majority with other uh, 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 founding partners started the Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights to address predatory lending. And here it is on the screen. You can, you can also visit it at responsiblebusinesslending.org. Uh, so a few of the things we, uh, we, we want to help try to enforce among lenders, the right to transparent pricing and terms, the right to non-abusive products, the right to responsible underwriting the right to fair treatment from brokers, the right to inclusive credit access, the right to fair collections process. Again, you can find the Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights also on our small business portal, which I mentioned earlier. This Bill of Rights is there to arm you as a business owner. At smallbusinessmajority.org in the Small Business Portal, there's also a checklist to help you ask yourself questions uh, as, you, as you see here on the screen. It's a checklist for dealing with lenders. You want to know what the interest rates are. Are there upfront fees? What's the payment amount and frequency? And this question is really important. Are there any prepayment penalties? Oftentimes, we see business owners want to pay ahead uh, with the online lenders, and sometimes there are penalties for paying off the principal ahead of the schedule, throwing off the loan's amortization. Amortization, simply put, is the schedule of payments. You want to know what's the full cost of the loan over its lifetime. If you're refinancing, you want to know are there any fees added into the existing principal. That's important to know also. And if you're going through a broker, is that broker disclosing their fees to you? We're also talking about access to capital because people need it. I'd like to say uh, uh, lenders with really good lending practices will look at the state of your business. Oftentimes, people will say that when you access capital, the best time to do it is when you don't need it because it's a good litmus test to see what the financial state of your business is. Do you have any financial stability? Is there a cash flow pro projection that's been done? And has it been done properly or at all? So as we talk about accessing capital to launch or grow your business, be aware that the best time to do it is when you don't need it because it's a good indicator of your financial state and processes and operations of your business. The CDFIs that I talked about, they work closely with nonprofits 
and technical assistance organizations to also help you with some of the pieces of information and processes that you may need strengthening up, such as record keeping, to really get you ready and better prepared to access capital and credit. Now, as you build your assets and get some funding to start up your business, <clears throat> don't forget about saving to pay yourself first and take care of your financial security for the future. So now we're going to get into some things around setting up retirement programs for yourself and for your employees. All right, so your money, your future, and the retirement crisis. Now, I ask people consistently what they thought was the average savings of working households in America for retirement, and I usually hear between 6000 and 50000 Now, I'll tell you in a second what the average savings is, and I think many of you will be surprised. Uh, there have been major shifts in retirement, and it's leaving many Americans simply unprepared for a comfortable retirement. As you'll learn from this web webinar, and I'm sure as you see in the news, uh, as a country, we're facing a fiscal challenge when it comes to retirement. In fact, you see on the screen, 86% of Americans believe the nation is facing a retirement crisis. 75% are concerned about their own ability to save. And barely one-third of ind individuals who aren't of age to retire actually save for retirement. They actually don't have any money set aside for retirement plan. As you can see, we do have a retirement crisis in America. The U.S. retirement gap, which is the gap between people's current savings and the amount they need to retire comfortably, is a huge gap between $6 trillion and $14 trillion. Now, that's a lot of money. There's a lot of reasons why savings for retirement is in such poor shape in this country. The median retirement account balance is actually around $3,000, not the $6,000 or $50,000 that, that I mentioned that people generally respond with uh, earlier. It's actually around $3,000. And I'm sure that surprises many of you. But some of the reason for this is that the traditional pension plan simply isn't a reality for most people anymore. The increased life expectancy is great uh, because we're living longer, we're healthier, but for retirement, that means we need more money to sustain us through our golden years. There are Social Security challenges. Social Security simply doesn't provide enough money for people to live on in retirement. I believe the average Social Security check is something like $1,300 a month. Uh, and there's also market uncertainties. With the shift away from uh, traditional pension plans to more 401k plans, which are dependent on the performance of the stock market, market volatility plays a huge role in how people are saving for retirement. I mentioned earlier about the recession of 2008. One of the outcomes was the decline of lending to small business owners. In addition, since the 2008 recession, you will also see the decline of pension plans and an increase in the number of people uh, who have been invested in 401k plans. Employees really want to save for retirement. Understand this, as a business owner, employees really want to save for retirement. And I would imagine that if you are self-employed, you really want to save for your own retirement because you're running the business and you're the most important employee in that business. Uh, and actually, there's a 2012 survey conducted by Transamerica Center for Retirement Studies, uh, and employees ranked retirement benefits as second only to health care benefits in deciding to work for an employer. Now, Small business majority has done their own research and, poll and polling in states like Illinois, California about retirement, and unilaterally across the board in many of our states, employers are concerned that their employees haven't saved enough 
and are unprepared for retirement. Our polling in Illinois shows that 80% of employers believe that their employees have not saved enough for retirement. And our polling in other states like California and Washington State shows similar results. So you might ask yourself, where do small businesses fit in? More than 40% of small business employees don't have a 401k plan because they say their job doesn't offer one. And more than 60% of part-time workers don't have workplace-based retirement accounts. Only 50% of workers at firms with less than 100 employees actually have access to retirement plans at work, compared to 89% at the large corporations. Small businesses often cite cost as a main concern. And some small businesses cite administrative burdens uh, as well as fiduciary burdens as a concern. 29% of business owners lack an understanding of how retirement plans work. And you'd be surprised to know that many small business owners feel that they must contribute. They believe that they have to contribute in order to set up a retirement plan or match contributions, which simply is not true. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the options of how you can save as a small business owner on behalf of your employees and the reason why I'm talking about workplace-based uh, savings plans is that survey after survey show the strongest savings for individuals comes with workplace-based retirement plans than if uh, your employees simply saved on their own. <clears throat> So, with regard to workplace-based retirement plans, now we're going to talk about understanding your options. What you need to know is there are more workplace-based uh, retirement plan options than at any time in our history. As noted, 29% of small business owners lacked an understanding of developing a workplace-based retirement plan, and we know we know that this can be overwhelming. So to help you grasp the ABCs of retirement, I'm just uh, going to give you a broad overview of the options for you as a small business owner to gain a better understanding for the options to consider for yourself and your employees. We know that dealing with retirement plans and savings plans uh, for yourself and your employees can be daunting for new and small business owners with limited resources and no dedicated HR department or individual. But there's good news, though. As I noted earlier, there are more workplace-based retirement plan options for small businesses than any time uh, in, in history, and the cost of operating a business retirement plan has gone down while the array of services and options have actually increased. The downside to you as a small business owner is uh, the options can be overwhelming at times, and we understand that. Uh, so we're going to offer you some basic information to help you understand, uh, navigate, and contend with some of the plans that may be pitched to you for retirement uh, and giving you an understanding of what's out there. Now, uh, once again, we are not giving financial advice, but just helping you understand what's out there as a small business owner. And as you can see here, there are, there are two types of plans. There are the defined benefit plans, which are usually employer-funded, which are pension plans uh, typically, which, employer, which the employer funds, and there's a guarantee of benefit at the end. There are defined contribution plans, and those are the ones that are more proliferation. Those are generally funded by the employee and our employer, and these are the plans that we're going to focus on in, the next, in just the next few minutes. There are two types of defined contribution plans. There are group trust plans, and there are IRA-based plans. Group trust plans offer greater fiduciary responsibility and cost to the employer, but there are more contribution options and higher rates to contribute from your salary for group trust plans. In a group trust plan, 
essentially all the funds are held in one trust. For an IRA-based plan, which is an individual retirement account, the funds are held in individual accounts for the participants from your business. There is less fiduciary responsibility and costs for you as the owner, but there's also fewer contribution options depending on the plan, uh, and depending on the plan, lower salary deferral. Uh, on, this, on this slide is just an example of the most common employer-based retirement plans offered uh, by small businesses. There are 401k plans, which is a group trust plan, again. Uh, there's individual 401k plans. There are SEP, SEP, SEP plans, and simple IRA plans. So these are some of the most common workplace-based retirement plans. And if you're looking for a 401k plan for a group, which is a group trust plan, be aware that there is a growing number of companies that now offer micro IRA plans. They specifically cater to small businesses that have five or fewer employees. So one of the things when you're shopping around, uh, you should ask people, uh, do they specialize in those plans, especially if you are a business that has uh, very few employees. Uh, and these are private market plans for retirement. Now, there's also government plans. There's a number of states that offer what's called secure choice plans. There are a number of states that see, that really recognize that there is a retirement crisis, and they can see that small businesses are one chief part of solving that crisis. So in many of these states, they have an auto deduction for employees at a low percentage rate of somewhere between 2 and 3%. Or there might be a marketplace-based plan, and it varies from state to state. Uh, but what it means to you as a business owner is you have less fiduciary responsibility while also helping your employees save for their retirement. Your employees will have a retirement account that is portable. They can take those funds with them if they separate from your company. So recognizing that small businesses often don't have an HR department or a designated person to do HR-related functions, these laws are now being created in many states across the country to help with the retirement crisis. And in the process, easing the burden of implementing a workplace-based retirement program for small businesses. Now, another reason to consider uh, implementing a workplace-based retirement plan is there is a tax credit uh, to offset the cost of setting up one. In an effort to encourage plan sponsorship, the federal government offers a valuable tax credit to help defray administrative costs involved with setting up a business retirement plan. The tax credit is available for each plan uh, we've discussed in this webinar. And that's provided that the plan covers at least one uh, uh, or more non-owner employees. So check with your state treasurer's office to see if you're in a state that has implemented secure choice and find out how you and your small business can benefit and also help your employees save for retirement. And one thing that I do want you to realize it is very low touch for you as an employer because basically your employee has complete control over operating this retirement plan through Secure Choice. So in comparing the plan and features, if you're considering a workplace-based retirement plan, again, we are not financial service advisors, but we're going to uh, to give you some tips on what to look for when you're trying to find the plan and work with your financial advisors or uh, uh, program brokers. So you want to look at, the, at employer eligibility. Is there a size of business restriction? Uh, are there employee compensation limits? Is there an age restriction to participate? If you have employees of college age, are they able to participate? Is there a service restriction? 
Ask yourself these questions before you talk to your uh, financial advisor or broker who's going to help you implement a plan. Does the plan only include employees that have been with you for a certain number of time, a certain amount of time, let, let's say like a thousand hours, or does it include new hires? If you're looking at a private workplace-based retirement plan, what are the fiduciary responsibilities for you as the employer and reporting to, with the IRS? You want to ask, uh, can contributions be made by you, the employer, and are they required or are they elective? And what contributions can you provide at a maximum if you're able to do so? And like I said, employers often offer retirement plans to attract and retain the best possible employees. And employee surveys, again, have shown retirement benefits as second most as the second most important benefit that potential employees look for in a workplace. And this is important. How simple and convenient is the plan to maintain? Because understand, someone at your business is going to have to maintain the plan. You want to know what are the fees and who pays them? Can a participant or your employee withdraw funds upon death, disability, or separation of service? And as you're talking to financial advisors or your broker, these are questions you need to assess to know what your resources and capacity are versus what you want to offer your employees. So earlier in this presentation, uh, I talked about ways to protect yourself when looking for capital through the, through the uh, Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights. But you also need to protect yourself when looking for a workplace-based retirement plan that best fits the needs of your business. Do not assume that brokers or financial advisors who pitch you a plan always have your best interests at heart. So just to recap, some of the most important things you need to be asking your financial advisor or broker when setting up a workplace-based retirement plan, uh, you know, are you a fiduciary? And do you commit to your fiduciary status in writing? Do you specialize in just one or two types of plans? What forms of compensation do you receive and from whom? You want to know who pays it. Are you paying it or, or who's paying it? Does your compensation vary based on what the investments are uh, 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 that are used in the plan? Does the plan record keeper receive revenue sharing payment from any of the investment providers? If the record keeper receives revenue sharing payments from investment providers, are these used to offset the administrative and record keeping costs? These are all questions that you need to be aware of. Now, we recognize that as small business owners, your time is pulled in a thousand different directions. But understand that setting up a retirement plan, a workplace-based retirement plan, is definitely worthwhile to consider for the benefit of your business and your employees. And without question, for the benefit of you as an owner. Because this workplace-based retirement plan could cover you and your future retirement security. Uh, and if you'd like to get more information regarding uh, retirement plans and workplace-based retirement plans, you can find more information on our resource portal, and you can visit it at smallbusinessportal.org forward slash retirement. So uh, just a, a couple of plugs before we get into our question and answer. <clears throat> we would love for you to... Uh, stay involved with Small Business Majority. Once again, we are a national nonprofit, 50123. We are not a membership organization. So all of the uh, education, information, advocacy work that we do on behalf of small businesses is free. So we do uh, hope that you continue to stay engaged with us. Um, we have lots of webinars uh, and we have lots of in-person uh, uh, presentations around things uh, on access to capital, uh, health care, and various issues, so we do ask that you stay engaged. Um, you can find us also at, uh, on, on Facebook at Small Business Majority, and if you find us on Twitter, you can find us at smlbizmajority.com. 
So uh, we're getting close to our time, uh, and I'll open it up to questions. Um, and again, you can type the questions in the lower left-hand box of your screen. I'll give everyone just a few moments, uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to type them there. I will uh, put myself on mute for a few moments and then come back and answer a couple questions before we close out. All right, uh, looks like we have a, just a few questions here. My first question is from Teresa in St. Louis. Uh, the question is, where or how do I find a broker? And I assume you mean for the workplace-based retirement plan. My suggestion, uh, Teresa, anytime I get this question, is that you need to stay engaged with the professionals uh, that help you uh, operate your business. And what the professionals I'm talking about are the attorneys, uh, the accountants, the people that are in sort of that professional uh, uh, space where they deal with uh, different types of businesses and business owners on a consistent basis. I would go to them potentially for recommendations or uh, ideas on how you move forward uh, with setting up your workplace-based retirement plan. I'm sure there are people they can connect with. All right, we have another question from Thomas. Uh, how do you choose between debt and equity financing? Uh, I touched on this a little earlier uh, in the webinar. Like I said, you have to be aware of the type of financing that, you, that is welcomed into your business. And the analogy that I generally like to use is sort of big tech versus, uh, you know, a more traditional business. If you have a, if you're starting a biochemical company, um, you know, your financing needs are going to be a lot different than if you're starting a lawn care company. Lawn care company needs, a, you know, a couple thousand dollars, a few thousand dollars to get uh, a couple of lawnmowers, maybe, uh, you know, some other ancillary tools, um, a truck or maybe even a trailer, uh, and they can do that, you know, maybe through a CDFI or a small personal loan, or they might even use credit cards to buy those things in order to get started. But if you're starting a biotech uh, company, you may need a large investment. So it may be a situation where you do want to look at, uh, you know, potentially finding ways to get seed capital. Uh, and then you might have to look at larger rounds of financing. Uh, and some of that financing you, you look for might be uh, angel investors, or, or maybe you have to go past that at some point and, uh, you know, uh, uh, sell securities in your business in order to, to raise capital. So it really depends on the type of business that you have and what type of funding is open to it. All right, now I'm going to take one last question. I'm going to say a, a question from Heather. Uh, how do I learn about CDFIs that are near me? Uh, if you go to smallbusinessportal.org, uh, there is an entrepreneurship portal, uh, an entrepreneurship page, uh, where you can actually search some of the CDFIs that uh, we work closely with, the small business majority. There are a lot more around the country than that. And we're not saying that you know other CDFIs aren't worthwhile checking out, but these are the ones that we're familiar with, uh, that folks that, that we uh, work with through small business majority are familiar with. So I would first go there and see if there are CDFIs in your area. Uh, if not, I'm sure you could do a simple uh, Google search and you know find some that are in your area. But CDFIs, like I said earlier, are generally there to walk you through the process uh, and to, to give you in-depth support through their services as well as technical assistance providers. So um, uh, that's where I would start if you're looking for a CDFI. All right, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, again, my name is Bill Ray. I'm Missouri Outreach Manager for Small Business Majority. Uh, feel free to contact me directly if you have any questions. You can reach me at 314-718-0377 or at wray at smallbusinessmajority.org. Uh, for everyone who uh, has remained on the call, what you'll receive is uh, when you get off uh, of this webinar, you'll get 
uh, you will be asked to fill out a survey. Once you fill out that survey, I will make sure that I email you the full presentation so you can have it for your reference. Uh, and once again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me, and I'll be glad to answer them. Again, you can find us uh, on Facebook. Just search Small Business Majority. You can find us on Twitter at SML Biz Majority. And I do thank you for joining me today. I hope everyone has a pleasant, pleasant rest of your Tuesday. Thank you so much.